I know this is the last lecture, but you can do it. <laughs> I know you, you're thinking, oh, I can't do one more. So this is, uh, this is about cardiovascular disease. And I'm going to tell you that I like statins and I don't like statins. I'm going to tell you that I like a lot about what we know about the cholesterol and heart, the diet hypothesis for heart disease. And there's a lot of things I don't like about it. I don't want you to take home that, uh, that I don't want to use medications. I use statins in my clinic all the time when needed. So, but I want you to hear the data behind this because I think it's going to shock you. The, sc the scope of cardiovascular disease in the U.S. I'm going to stand over here and see if maybe the feedback is different. Uh, well, if I can. We're going to talk about the mechanism of coronary disease in the U.S. We'll re review standard laboratory testing. We'll talk about some advanced laboratory testing and advanced imaging, ultrasound and CT. And we'll look at effective medications, both natural and otherwise. So 1.3 million heart attacks each year in this country, 800,000 strokes, 640,000 deaths. Clearly, in the last 30 years, we've made a big difference. Cardiovascular disease has declined. There's still a lot. There's residual risk there. We want to look at some advanced lipid testing and inflammation testing so we can uncover some of this risk. And we want to look at some ultrasound or some advanced imaging so we can also uncover risk where we may not knew it, what, knew it was there. So it's not a simple plumbing problem. We all know that now. We know that it, it is a gradual accumulation of plaque and calcium and the artery gets clogged off. We know that 68% of people that have a heart attack have a heart attack in a vessel that is only 50% occluded before it erupts, the plaque erupts. And it's really more like a volcano than it is like a slow occlusion of that artery. It starts with endothelial injury, smoking and stress and high cholesterol and inflammation. And then these, these monocytes become foam cells as they ingest the LDL right under the lining. They create plaque. And then if there's chronic inflammation, this plaque can rupture. And so in this slide on the right is a ruptured artery, artery less than 50% occluded, where the plaque ruptured. You get a cascade of this, um, uh, this thrombotic event inside the artery. You have an occlusion and a heart attack or a stroke. These plaques can be unstable, and we can do something about unstable plaques, and we'll talk about that. So much of cardiovascular disease is preventable. We can even do better than we're doing now. So statins are common and important medical solution. I believe, and I think you, you will see why I believe that, that we use statins too much. I also believe we're not using them enough in the right people. And sometimes not even enough. Forgive me, should we treat him? Hands up, yes, no. So mostly we're saying no, okay. So this is, oh goodness, I went only through it again. Sorry. I want to go over. Statin users in studies tend to eat more. They tend to have more calories. They tend to weigh more. Statin t users tend to exercise less. And when they exercise, it's known that statin decreases mitochondrial function and decreases their capacity to gain muscle and gain cardiovascular benefit. OK? Um, what people do, I think, and I, uh, is they get up in the morning, they take their statin, they put that cloak of armor on, and they say, well, maybe I can have that donut. And, you know, walking at lunch, I'll do that tomorrow. I think that happens in our people. They think that statins are so powerful that they're a cloak of armor. Let's look at secondary prevention. Treatment of patients, of course, who have had a heart attack. The number needed to treat is down to 39. 39 people every day for five years. To save a life, you need to treat 83 people every day for five years. The numbers needed to harm are the same. This is that journal I can't pronounce, a diabetes journal. January 2015, 46% increased risk of diabetes in this group of patients that were treated with a statin for six years. This is the BMJ 2015, the effect of statins on average survival. 
they said that for primary prevention, if you give a person a statin throughout their life, you're going to increase their life by 5 to 19 days. For secondary prevention, between 10 and 27 days. The British Medical Journal. Surprisingly small gain in survival. 2016 BMJ, lack of association or inverse association between low density lipoprotein cholesterol and mortality. Conclusion, LDL is inversely associated with mortality in people over 60. This is Dr. Rita Redberg. Dr. Redberg, I heard speak at a national forum in February. She is professor of cardiology, San Francisco General. She is the editor-in-chief of JAMA Internal Medicine. This is what she said verbatim. I do not recommend statins for primary prevention. Not in women, certainly, as the data is very weak. And the data is not very good for men either, number needed to treat 104. She went on to say, and I didn't write this here, she goes, I've read every one of those studies, I believe her, as the editor of that journal. This is the residual risk of people taking statins. These are the major studies, like the West of Scotland study, and the CARE study, and the Lipid study. And despite decreasing the risk of heart attacks, there was still 62%, 76%, 75% of the people, I mean, the, of the heart attacks still occurred. It's not that they don't work, but they're not a cloak of armor. Astounded, astounded when I heard Rita Redberg say that. And this is the power of prevention. We've seen this slide, 93% decrease in, heart, in diabetes, 81% decrease in, in myocardial infarctions by eating vegetables, moving every day, maintaining health, and not smoking. This sort of study has been repeated numerous times in the last 15 years. This is a big study, Epic Potsdam study. So cholesterol levels are important, but 50% of the people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol levels. Hmm. This is that graph. So these are the cholesterol levels, and these are all the ones less than 130. These are the people that were admitted to the hospital who had had an MI. Cholesterol is involved. It's not the only piece of the puzzle, though. So the risk factors, we all know these. Age, smoking, family history, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, diabetes. These are standard risk factors. Standard cholesterol testing. We know that high cholesterol is bad. We know that, that total cholesterol is the good plus the bad. We know that LDL is lousy. Triglycerides are terrible. And HDL is lousy. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I think it really pertains here. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not any simpler. Coronary heart disease is not as simple as lowering cholesterol, right? So this is an American Heart Association publication. Um, and they list seven things that are important. They circle cholesterol, maybe indicating that it might be the most important. I don't know if that's what they were trying to indicate. But clearly we know by the Epic Potsdam study and other things that not smoking, getting moving, eating vegetables is much, much, much more powerful. And it doesn't mean you can't do both. I mean, the right people, you want to do everything. You want to use all of the armamentarium. So, you know, when we measure LDL cholesterol, you can remember that it's a milligram, so it's a weight, per deciliter, right? Some people can have an LDL of 130 and have just a few large LDL particles. Some people can have an LDL of 130 and a whole bunch of small, dense, nefarious particles that can easily slip through the endothelial lining. We know how to measure this now, the size of the LDL particles. If HDL2 is too low, which is the most effective HDL, they also have more risk. If homocysteine, which we know is a vascular toxin, is greater than about 9, not 15 like it says on, normal, on our testing, about 9 tells us that they have increased risk. If HSCRP is elevated, they have increased risk. If they have many, if, well, the LDL particle number now is known to be the most important factor that we can test to tell us about cholesterol-related risk. Not the milligram per deciliter, it's the number of particles. And small, dense LDL are nefarious. There's other things we can look at, like lipoprotein A, which makes the cholesterol molecule, it has its little hook on the end of it, that makes it more dangerous. 
we can measure that. We can look at LPPLA2 that tells us about inflammation along the plaque. We can measure that. We can measure myeloperoxidase, which is secreted from those monocytes that become foam cells that cause inflammation in the plaque. We can measure that now. This is a, an advanced heart lab panel. This is available to your patients. Most patients can get this for $100 or less. And it tells us about lipid particle number. It tells us about the size of the HDL. That's over on the right. That's the HDL map. You want big fat HDL because they're more effective. It tells us about inflammation markers like CRP and LPPLA2 and myeloperoxidase. So let's go back to our example. Total cholesterol was 198. We elected not to treat him. Um, but let's see if we can uncover more risk here. Fibrinogen was normal. The HDL2 was low. Homocysteine was 13.5, which is known to be high enough to be a cardiovascular endothelial toxin. HSCRP was 3.6. That's certainly out of range. LDL particle number was 1,850, very high. Small dense LDL percentage was high. Lipoprotein A was normal. Lip LPPLA2 was normal. Myeloperoxidase was abnormal, showing he had a lot of inflammation in his plaque. This guy needs, I think, needs to be treated for his, and exactly how you treat him with his diet. You might be able to change it with that, et cetera. Put him on some curcumin, but he's got some risk here. Maybe he needs statins. And the way, way I'd find that out is I'd look at his carotids, and I might look at his coronary arteries through a CAT scan. We'll talk about both of those in a minute. This is patient number two. Total cholesterol, 260. HDL, 82 triglycerides 87, LDL 148. We elected to treat her. Fibrinogen was normal. HDL2 was excellent. Lots of big effective HDL molecules. Homocysteine, normal. HSCRP less than one. LDL particle number, 1,350. So she's got big, big LDL particles. Not so dangerous. Very little small dense LDL. Lipoprotein A, normal. LPPLA2 normal. Myeloperoxidase, normal. Now, many of these people that have this high cholesterol that makes me nervous, I'm also going to look at their carotid arteries to see if they're developing plaque. And we can so this is the, the CIMT, the carotid intima medial thickness, costs 100 bucks done at some of our radiology centers. You're, they're going to have to pay cash for it. It's a quick test, obviously no radiation. And what we're looking for is the thickness of the intima. I mean, if they have a big plaque in there, it's all over. We know they've got disease, but we're just thick. And, and if, the, if the thickness is greater than one millimeter, that means they're already developing significant vascular disease. This is a study that verifies that it said that the ultrasound derived plaque metrics independently predict cardiovascular events in our cohort and improve risk prediction. That's what we want to do in those two people, don't we? We want to see if they do have risk or not. And does help predict coronary heart disease events. Uh, and it adds to the Framingham score. Inexpensive, no radiation, adds to what we do. Can help us keep people that really don't need statins because of the number needed to harm off them. And it can help us get, them, get us on and uncover risk of people that may not be otherwise. This is the coronary artery scan. Annals of internal medicine. Long-term prognosis of the coronary arterial calcification scan in asymptomatic patients. Conclusion, this coronary arterial scan accurately predicts 15-year mortality. That is, if it's really low, the likelihood of an event is less than 5% over 15 years. This is, this is what it looks like. We can measure this very specifically. This test, believe it or not, cost 100 bucks, $105, and is, and is available in our community. This is how you look at it. So if it's zero, there's no identified calcium burden at all. The likely is 5% 15 years. Goes all the way down to 400, and I've seen 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, and that likelihood is much higher in that 15 years or less. There's a lot of power in this the prevention. We can, and there's also power in statins, but remember this, please. 
Dr. David Katz, who is a, a preventive medicine specialist at, at Yale, said that there is nutrition and lifestyle, and then there's everything else in medicine. He said that there is immense power in our forks, in our feet, in our fingers. fingers. This is just another study that validates the, the Epic Potsdam. This is a Lancet study in 2007, and what they said that, this is a British study, you might imagine. Thus, eating fruits and vegetables, taking exercise and avoiding smoking could lead to an 80% decrease in heart attacks, 81% in the other study. These are consistent. Is cracking before our eyes. Let me show you why. So this is Ansel Keys' study. I talked about Ansel Keys, this very important man from Minnesota, and the seven country study, right? Look at that. There's no question. More fat, more heart disease. It, it was clear as day. I mean, we had to respond. Well, Ansel Keys became one of the most uh, known physicians in the 1960s. I think this is like 1962. Well, it turned out that it wasn't a seven country study, folks. It was a 22 country study. And when you put the scattergram up there, there was no correlation at all. Because in fact, France is way over here with huge amounts of cholesterol and saturated fat. They don't have much heart disease there. He selectively chose those countries. And he changed food policy and medicine for 50 years, did Ansel Keys. Whoops, actually 22 uh, this is 2016, M Dr. Mazafarian, who wrote some of the USDA guidelines. Big, big change in fat and heart disease. We found that too little intake of healthy fat was a big problem, much bigger problem than saturated fat. I want you to go home with that idea. It's not like saturated fat's perfect, it's neutral, right? It's neutral, but it's not big and problematic, right? I don't want you to go home and think it's, you know, um, eat a bunch of butter necessarily. You can have some butter. He said, instead of eating two slices of bread, he said, douse a half a piece in olive oil and enjoy that instead. Eat more fat, particularly from olives and nuts. Journal of the American Heart Association, January 2016, the impact of non-optimal intake of saturated fats, polyunsaturated fats on coronary heart disease. We estimate that nearly 50,000 Americans die of heart disease annually because they eat too little fat. This is another study that kind of cracks away at this diet heart cholesterol hypothesis. This was a study that was published in April. This drug, and I can't pronounce it, had amazing benefits. 12,000 patients, 37% decrease in LDL. 130% increase in HDL, wow. No difference, no difference at all in outcomes, none at all. Down LDL, up HDL, no difference in outcomes, 12,000 patients. Clearly, cholesterol plays a role, but there's some questions of exactly how that role is played. This is the, uh, this is the Minnesota coronary experiment, also Dr. Keyes, and I told you what he did there, how he manipulated and didn't present this data. I won't read through this again. This is the sugar industry study that I talked about, how they shh sugar, right? This is Dr. Walter Willett's explanation of what we should think about fat. Trans fats are really bad. Refined starch and sugar, really bad for us. Saturated fat and carbohydrates like rice and things like that are probably neutral. When we get into whole grains like quinoa and whole grain oats and beans and lentils, it's improving health significantly. And when we add olive oil and nuts, we also improve our health. 30% of the calories daily in the Mediterranean diet is from olive oil. Olive oil is amazing. I'll just mention the portfolio diet. This is a way to lower your patient's blood LDL by 15% by adding nuts, by adding things like apples and oats, by adding plant sterols that you can get in things like Smart Balance, by adding things like lentils and beans and artichoke. Food is powerful medicine and, and um, greens and berries and nuts decrease heart disease by 50%, one serving of each. Take that home with you. You know, berries have amazing polyphenols. They're low glycemic. They're great in fiber. Nuts have those oils that do wonderful things for our cardiovascular system. And greens, just lots of nutrients, lots of fiber, lots of antioxidants. So, 
You've seen this. Eat this, not this. And if you can make a difference in your patients' lives, just a little bit, just a little bit moving them to the, to the left, it's beneficial. I'm going to talk to, you, talk to you about some natural supplements and how they work in lowering cardiovascular risk. Red yeast rice, I'll show you a study. There, it document is, works better than Pravastatin. Phytosterols, those are those plant steroid-like molecules, cholesterol-like molecules that come from plants that you can get in things like Smart Balance or you can get them in supplements. Both red yeast rice, phytosterols, lower cholesterol. Niacin also lowers cholesterol, increases HDL, and, and increases the size of the LDL particle, so it lowers the risk. Berberine, which comes from the golden seal plant and is available now, uh, berberine increases LDL receptor expression on the liver, so it lowers LDL cholesterol. Aged garlic does the same. On the right side are things that lower inflammation at the endothelial wall, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol, quercetin, and lycopene. We have a, we have a, nut we have a nutrient combination that we give people, and I routinely see 30% decrease in cholesterol with this, with lower inflammation markers. And I followed some of these patients over the years where I can see their carotid interval medial thickness go from 1.8 to 1.6 to 1.4. Their risk goes down. This is the study in the Annals of Internal Medicine showing that, that Reggie's rice works, is a statin, but it's a family of statins. There's eight different statin-like molecules in there. And people that, are res people that have had statin sensitivity and intolerance can use red yeast rice, and it's just as effective or more than pravastatin. Red yeast rice and therapeutic lifestyle changes decrease LDL cholesterol level without increasing CPK in dyslipidemic patients, well tolerated. This is another one on to the tolerability of red yeast rice. 2,400 milligrams, which is a common dose. Decreased 30% in red yeast rice was the LDL, where it, where it was a 27% decrease with statin. This is the, the combination I use, it's called Lipocardia, that has all of those eight or 10 things that I talked about a few minutes ago. A couple of, I think, really good cardiovascular resources. I really love Dr. Gundry. Dr. Gundry is a cardiovascular surgeon from, from California, Loma Linda. He is actually a cardiovascular surgeon that did some of the heart transplants, baboon baby, years ago. A very innovative man. He doesn't practice cardiovascular surgery anymore. He does have an integrated practice of, of, um, of cardiology. And, and this book is wonderful. And it, he's, he's, it's short, and it's sweet, and he's funny. People read it and they get it. And what basically he tells them is to eat meat and vegetables, or a whole lot of vegetables and some meat. Get off the processed carbs. When you do that, metabolic syndrome, triglycerides, LDL just drop out. And this is one that, if, that follows more of a vegetarian lifestyle. This is the Whole Heart Solution by Dr. Khan, who is uh, from Ohio. I think it's Wayne State. Both very good books. Particularly like Dr. Gundry's in regards to being accessible from the cognitive uh, understanding of most any patient in our clinic. So to better understand risk, advanced lipid panels really do better help us better understand risk. CIMT, that's a good tool. It's inexpensive, no radiation. Crowded coronary scans can be helpful in the right patient. Not everybody needs it. Not everybody needs it, but I'll tell you that that guy with the, the cholesterol of 198, he needed it. He was 49 years old. If he had a big burden, we needed to get on that, that for him to lower his risk. Move daily. Don't smoke. Add healthy fats. Limit sugar and refined carbs. Maintain a healthy weight. Eat the vegetables. And that's how we can improve heart health in all of us and all of our patients. And thanks for hanging in there. I hope, I hope this was worthwhile for you. It was a real pleasure to uh, put together. And I, I can take a question or two if you have any. If not, we'll call it a day. Yes? Your last slide there, one of the last ones about heavy metals. What did you find? I, chelation. Does anybody want to see the study on chelation? I think you might be astounded by this. This is the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the TAC trial. It was done from 2002 until a couple of years back. And what they did is they took people who have already had a heart attack and they chelated them 40 times with IV chelation EDTA. And what they did is they then followed them and they found this. 
that they had a, an 18% decrease cardiovascular event, that the number needed to treat was 18, where we know the number needed to treat in statins is 39. And interestingly, if they were diabetics, they even did better, more striking results, 41% decrease in endpoints. It is not taking the calcium out of the arteries. It's taking the lead out of the system because lead decreases our ability to use nitric oxide as a vasodilator. Lead causes inflammation along the endothelium. This is a big, important study. We should be, I think we should be using this in our community, not as a sole treatment, but as an adjunct for people that have resistant recalcitrant cardiovascular disease. Big study, 130 different sites, big difference. They're repeating this study now, but we know about EDTA, absolutely safe, folks. So this, is, this, this seems like um, I, something you may not want to believe, but this is the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And the, the name of the study was The Unexpected Results of Chelation Therapy in Cardiovascular Risk. Um, this is going on around the country. There's, there's physicians in Springfield that are doing it. There's physicians in, in St. Louis. There's physicians in Kansas City. It's not for everybody, but it's for that select people that are vasculopaths, right? This is important, I think. And I'd, I'd really like to see... Thank you. That's all I'll say about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you.